Hello, and welcome to Unworthy History. We talk about actual history on this channel. And today I'm going to bring you a story from this book right here, The Adventures of Bigfoot Wallace by John C. Duvall, Texas Ranger and Hunter, published back in 1871. Uh, so this story today is about uh, Bigfoot Wallace and his struggle for life, his fight with the Big Indian. In the fall of 42, the Indians were worse on the frontiers than they had ever been before or since. You couldn't stake a horse out at night with any expectation of finding him the next morning, and a fellow scalp wasn't safe on his head five minutes outside of his own shanty. The people on the frontiers at last came to the conclusion that something had to be done, or else they would be compelled to fall back on the settlements. So we collected together by agreement at my ranch, organized a company of about 40 men, and the next time the Indians came down from the mountains, and we hadn't long to wait for them, we took the trail, determined to follow it as long as our horses would hold out. On the third day out, we found Indian signs as plentiful as pig tracks around a corn crib, and I told the captain we would have to move very cautiously, or we would be apt to find ourselves before long in a hornet's nest. That night, we camped at a water hole and put out a double guard. Just before the sun went down, I had noticed a smoke apparently about three miles to the northeast of us, and I felt satisfied that there was a party of Indians encamped at that place. So I went to the captain and had told him, if he would give me the leave to do so, I would get up an hour or two before daylight and reconnoiter the position and find out whether there were any Indians there or not, and if so, to what tribe they belonged, what their number was, etc. He was willing enough to let me go and told the guards to pass me out whenever I wanted to leave. I wetted up old Butch a little, ran two bullets down the throat of Sweet Lips, and about two hours before daylight I left camp and started off in the direction of the smoke I had seen the evening before. The chaparral in some places was as thick as the hair on a dog's back, but I scuffled through it in the dark, and after traveling perhaps a mile and a half, I came to a deep canyon that seemed to head up in the direction I had seen the smoke. I scrambled down into it and waited until day began to break, and then slowly and cautiously continued my course along the bottom of the canyon. The canyon was very crooked and in some places so narrow that there was hardly room enough in it for two men to travel abreast. At length I came to a place where it made a sudden bend to the left, and just as I turned the corner I came plump up against a big Indian, who was coming down the canyon, I suppose, with the intention of spying out our camp. We were both stooping down when we met, and our heads came together with considerable force, and the Indian rolled one way and I the other. Both rose about the same time, and so unexpected was the encounter that we stood for a moment uncertain as to what to do, and glaring upon each other like two catamounts when they were about to dispute the carcass of a dead deer. The Indian had a gun as well as I, but we were too close to each other to shoot, and it seemed we both came to the same conclusion as to what was best to be done at that same instant, for we dropped our rifles and grappled with each other without saying a word. You see, boys, I'm a pretty stout man yet, but in those days, without meaning to brag, I don't believe there was a white man west of the Colorado River that could stand up against me in a regular catamount. Bear hug, hand-to-hand -hand fight. But the minute I hefted that Indian, I knew I had undertaken a job that would bring the sweat from me, and maybe so, I thought, a little blood, too, before it was satisfactorily finished. He was nearly as tall as I am, say six feet one or two inches, and would weigh, I suppose, about 175 pounds net, for he had no clothes on worth mentioning. I had the advantage of him in weight, but he was as wiry and active as a cat and as slick as an eel, and no wonder either, for he was greased from head to foot with bear's oil. At it we went, and right down earnest, without a word being spoken by either of us, first up one side of the canyon, and then down in the bottom, then up the other side, and the dust and gravel flew in such a way that if any one had been passing along the bank above, they would have supposed that a small whirlwind was raging below. I was a little the strongest of the two, however, and when we rose to our feet I could throw the Indian easily enough. But the moment he touched the ground, he would give himself sort of a squirm like a snake and pop right up on top of me, and I couldn't hold him still a moment. He was so slick with the bear's grease. Each of us was trying to draw his butcher's knife from the sheath all the time, but we kept each other so busy neither could get a chance to do it. 
At last I found that my breath began to fail me and came to the conclusion that if something wasn't done pretty soon, I should have my note taken to a certainty, for the Indian was like a lobos wolf and was getting better the longer he fought. So the next time we rose, I put out all the strength I had left in me and gave him a backhanded trip that brought his head with great force against a sharp pointed rock that was laying upon the ground. He was completely stunned by the shock for an instant, and before he fairly came to, I snatched my knife from the sheath and drove it with all my strength up to the hilt in his body. The moment he felt the cold steel, he threw me off of him as if I had been a ten-year-old boy, sprang upon me before I could rise, drew his own butcher knife, and raised it above his head with the intention of plunging it into my breast. I tell you what, boys, I often see that Indian now in my dreams, particularly after eating a hearty supper of bear's meat and honey, grappling me by the throat with his left hand and the glittering butcher knife lifted up above me with his right, and his two fierce black eyes gleaming like a panther's in the dark. Under such circumstances, it is astonishing how fast a man will think. He thinks faster than the words can fly over those newfangled telegraph lines. I looked up to the blue sky and bid it a long farewell, and to the green trees, the sparkling waters, and the bright sun. Then I thought of my mother as I remembered her when I was a little boy. The old home, the apple orchard, the brook where I used to fish for minnows, and the commons where I used to ride every stray donkey and pony I could catch. And then I thought of Alice Ann, a blue-eyed, partridge-built young woman I had a leaning to, who lived down in the Zumwalt settlements. All these and many more thoughts besides flashed through my mind in the little time that knife was gleaming above my breast. All at once the Indian gave a keen yell, and down came the knife with such force that it was buried to the hilt in the hard earth close to my side. The last time I had thrown the Indian, a deep gash had been cut in his forehead by the sharp-pointed rock, and the blood running down into his eyes from the wound blinded him, so that he missed his aim. I fully expected him to repeat his blow, but he lay still and made no attempt to draw the knife from the ground. I looked at his eyes, and they were closed, hard and fast, but there was a devilish sort of grin still about his mouth, as if he had died under the belief that he had sent me before him into the happy hunting grounds. I threw him off of me, and he rolled to the bottom of the canyon, stone dead. My knife had gone directly to his heart. I looked at him some time, lying there so still and stiffening fast in the cool morning air, and I said to myself, Well, old fellow, you made a good fight of it anyhow, and if luck hadn't been against you, you would have taken my sign in too, to a certainty, and Alice Ann would have lost the best string she's got to her bow. And now, said I to myself, old fellow, I am going to do for you what I never did for an Indian before. I am going to give you a decent Christian burial. So I broke his gun into a dozen pieces and laid them beside him according to the Indian custom, so it might be handy for him when he got to the happy hunting grounds. Though if they haven't first-rate smiths there, I don't think it will be fit for use any time soon. And then I pulled up some pieces of rock from the sides of the canyon and piled them around and over him until he was completely covered and safe from the attacks of coyotes and other animals. And there I have no doubt his bones are to this day. This is a true account of my fight with the big Indian in the canyon. So that's the end of uh, another Bigfoot Wallace story right there. He told this to John C. Duvall, who then uh, wrote it down. This is a story of him really coming face to face with his counterpart, uh, a big Indian who, like Bigfoot Wallace, had taken up a scouting mission. Uh, and they met in this canyon and uh, fought it out. And Bigfoot uh, narrowly uh, escaped with his life. So if you want to hear more stories like this, then be sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.